Well, it is really an honor to be here. Um, and I just want to say a couple of words about Archaeology Southwest and Bill Doley before I jump into this program. About, uh, I think it was probably six years ago, um, Bill and another leader in Southwestern uh, archaeology convened a meeting of the directors of organizations across the Southwest that uh, work in the field of archaeology. And uh, it was a, the, the group was originally referred to as the Pentagon of the Southwest because there were five of us and um, nothing to do with the, the military, but just, you know, there was, if you plotted all the museums that made a rough Pentagon. Um, and we never quite shook that name, uh, although we're now called the Southwest Archaeological something group. Uh, partnership, that's it, SWAP. Anyway, um, but those meetings uh, turned out to be incredibly uh, valuable and important, I think, for all of us. Uh, we came together and shared our visions, our common problems, uh, talked about funding, talked about where we were all headed, and we were all, in one point or another, involved in strategic planning. And uh, it's really been, and, and we all became really good friends. That was the best part of it all. And it was, it's been a great experience. And through that, I've had the opportunity to learn a lot about Archaeology Southwest. And, and it's an incredibly impressive organization. And I just think the world of your leader, Bill Doley. So I just, I really had to say that. Um, it's also, um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I also wanted to uh, just acknowledge the presence here of one of my predecessors, Art Wolf, who's back there in the back of the room. Hi, Art, it's great to see you. And um, a former trustee of the museum, uh, Dr. Ray Thompson, uh, is here as well. So, so I don't know if Bill made it clear. I, I'm president emeritus. I officially retired at the end of June. Uh, although I'm continuing to work with the museum on several different projects right now, uh, two exhibit projects and two capital improvement projects. So I'm still somewhat uh, Im immersed in things at the museum, um, but I happily turned over the CEO role to a wonderful new director, a woman named Carrie Heinenen. So just a little bit about our museum, if you're not familiar with it, of course, we're in Flagstaff. We describe ourselves as a place-based museum. In other words, our mission is about a place in the world that's called the Colorado Plateau. And it's this huge part of northern Arizona and southern Utah and a little bit of uh, Colorado and New Mexico, 130,000 square miles. That includes some of the most amazing landscapes you can imagine. So if you think about the Grand Canyon or Zion, Bryce, Arches, Canyonlands, Mesa Verde, the Navajo Reservation, the Hopi Reservation, Havasupai, all of these places are on the Colorado Plateau and they're all within the interest of the Museum of Northern Arizona. And we like to say we look at the plateau through different lenses, the lenses of, the lens of science, the lens of art, and within the sciences, we do geology, paleontology, archaeology, cultural anthropology or ethnology, um, ecology, and, uh, and various aspects of the biological sciences and art. And so we're a, we're, we're, we have a wide-ranging focus. But today, I just want to talk about our long-term uh, engagement with and involvement with some of the native tribes of the Colorado Plateau and how that those kinds of relationships are evolving. Uh, so this is a view of the front of the museum and this is what it looked like in uh, the early 1940s. And this is our staff in 1936, a little bit smaller uh, than it is today, but an incredibly distinguished staff. In the center are the founders of the museum, 
um, Mary Russell Farrell Colton, and the tall guy with the, the goatee is Harold Sellers Colton, and uh, he was a scientist and she was an artist. And the original corporate name of the institution was the Northern Arizona Society of Science and Art. So they very much believed in the integration of science and art. And they brought both perspectives to the development of the museum. Uh, I just want to note some other interesting people. Maybe some of you who are in, know Southwestern archaeology know the name of John C. McGregor. And that's uh, John McGregor. Uh, Lyndon Lane Hargrave another important figure in the early history of dendrochronology. Catherine Bartlett was the first curator of uh, ethnology and anthropology and later librarian at the museum. And I got to know her well in my early years at the museum back in the 70s. Uh, Jimmy Kiwan Waitua was uh, on the staff of the museum from about 1930 to the time he died in 1965 and was a real important cultural ambassador for the museum. He used to sit in our lobby and carve Kachina dolls. And as far as we know, he's the first person to ever sign Kachina dolls. And um, we have about 140 of his dolls in our museum collection today. And then over on the far side here is a man who is the curator of art in the 1930s. His name is Virgil Hubert. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about him in a minute. The Coltons. Uh, came to Northern Arizona from Philadelphia. They first came through Flagstaff in 1912 on their honeymoon, uh, fell in love with the region and started coming out every summer. Uh, and in the summer of 1913, in fact, they, they went out to, came back out from Philadelphia where he was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. And they stopped at Hubble's trading post and then uh, proceeded on up to the first Mesa on the Hopi bases in the company of Theodore Roosevelt to watch the Hopi snake dance. Um, and so they just you know, became captivated with the whole landscape uh, of the Colorado Plateau and started returning uh, on a regular basis and then permanently relocated to Flagst or located to Flagstaff in 1926. And then in 1928, they founded the Museum of Northern Arizona. Well. As a result of their experiences, they became very interested in the Native American tribes of Northern Arizona, particularly the Hopi and Navajo. You're gonna hear a lot about the Hopi because there are some really interesting stories associated with the Hopi, and so I've been accused of being Hopi-centric, and I suspect that there may be some truth to that. So, but um, we, we really try to engage with all the different tribes of the plateau. So here are the Coltons up on the Hopi mesas and um, visiting a family. And Mary Russell, in 1930, started a, an, a program that continues to this day. It was originally called the Hopi Craftsman Exhibition, um, which was a, an annual exhibition of Hopi arts and crafts. And her idea was that in the depths of the Depression, um, it was really tough. It was a tough economy out there and very little market for Hopi arts and crafts in those days. And so she wanted to stimulate the market and encourage uh, continuation of certain craft skills. Uh, and so this uh, program was started at the museum in the summer of 1930 and continues today. We now call it the Hopi Festival of Arts and Culture. And this is what the, uh, that exhibit looked like in the 1930s. It was just a huge quantity of pottery and basketry and weavings be displayed on the patio of the museum. And uh, here's Mary Russell with the, the pottery exhibit. And uh, what was fun for me is in the 1970s, I actually um, was put in charge of this program uh, and had the opportunity to do exactly what the Coltons did. They would go out every year and spend two full weeks, uh, five days each, going literally door to door, knocking on doors, and asking for things to bring to Flagstaff for this exhibition. And, you know, you'd knock on the door and people would disappear into the back room and come out with a stack of baskets or you'd walk in and there'd be pottery all around and they'd say, here, take it. 
And um, that had been going on since 1930, and I came along in 1976 and started doing this. And by then, that bond between the museum and the Hopi people was, were, was really strong. And they completely trusted us with all this incredibly valuable stuff to take down the Flagstaff. And, you know, we had an opportunity to sit in the living room and just sit and talk and, and share stories and perspectives. Uh, and it was great fun. So, uh, but I want to just tell you about a, uh, one little side story that goes along with the Hopi Craftsman Exhibition. This is 1930. Seven, and this is a man named Pierce Kiwan Waitua, who is the brother of Jimmy Kiwan Waitua, who worked at the museum. And he's making jewelry. But you notice the jewelry that he's making. In those days, Hopi jewelry was virtually indistinguishable from Navajo jewelry. And um, this, and so, and, and so, you know, the question became, well, how could the Hopis maybe better market uh, their jewelry? Um, and Mary Russell Farrell Colton just got this idea in her head that, you know, hey, you can't tell the difference between Navajo jewelry and other, you know, Zuni and Pueblo jewelry. Um, and that's really a shame because they have so many concepts, um, uh, you know, so many, so much iconography that could be employed in the production of jewelry that if they could just find a way to do that, they would have a style of jewelry that would be completely different. So, um, and she mentions that the Hopi have beautiful flowing pottery designs and distinctive textile and basketry designs offer great possibilities for adaptation to silver. So there's, you know, a pottery design and prehistoric. You're probably familiar with some of these patterns. This is a Hopi basket with what's called a whirlwind design. Um, it's a wicker basket. So Mary Russell asked Virgil Hubert, who, who I pointed out to you a few minutes ago, who was the curator of art, to come up with some ideas about how Hope, tr traditional Hopi designs could be incorporated into silver jewelry. And um, so, this was one of the concepts, uh, and it's a single piece of silver with a, another piece of silver that has been cut out and then placed on top of the first piece of silver and, you know, soldered together. And so one piece overlays the other. Okay, so um, now let me go back one. There you see that, that basket redesign? And then there's this, and then there's this. And uh, this is a piece most likely made um, by a man named Paul Sufki. And it is one of the very earliest pieces of Hopi overlay jewelry. So at one of the uh, Hopi shows, uh, there was this exhibit that showed, um, was suggestions for jewelry designs and, you know, drawings from the pottery. And so pieces like this were made. And again, this is, this, these are two pieces of silver that were originally flat, and the upper piece, the design was cut out and overlays the lower piece. And there you see, remember seeing that ancient pottery design? Well, there it is in silver. And there's the museum's logo. Well, World War II came along and everything came to a screeching halt with the Hopi Silver Project until after the war. And after World War II, um, two, uh, well, one of the artists that you, whose work you saw earlier, Paul Sufki, who did one of those first pieces of overlay, and his friend, Fred Kabote, a very famous Hopi artist, convened a group of uh, returning Hopi GIs at the Hopi Arts and Crafts Guild on Second Mesa and began talking about this idea of incorporating traditional designs into Hopi silver. 
And uh, they also founded the, what's called the Hopi Arts and Crafts Guild. Uh, and so here they are. And they started developing marks so that their pieces could be individually identified and also identified with the Hopi Arts and Crafts Guild. So um, through these classes, they um, taught a number of artists in the overlay technique. And uh, each person then developed his own mark uh, to identify his piece of silver. Interestingly enough, these marks um, are all related to the individual's clan. And so they are clan symbols. So the identity of the individual is not only with the single individual, but also with the clan that he is from. So Paul Sufki, he's Snow Clan here, and that's his, his mark there. So, and here are some, some silver pieces and the marks that you see on the back of them. And so out of that emerged uh, a, a long and great tradition of Hopi overlay jewelry. And today we think of overlay as being traditional Hopi jewelry. That's, that's what Hopi jewelry is, by and large. But as you can see, it only dates to the late 1930s. And the role of the museum in kind of getting the idea rolling for this style of jewelry. Well, I'm gonna fast forward now to uh, 2005. I uh, became a director or the president of the museum in early 2004. And at that time, uh, we had, a, had been working on a project called the uh, Hopi Mural Project. And that project had run into some trouble. I'll just leave it at that. It just, it, it just, it has, it hadn't gone well. And so um, in, in conversation with Hopi leadership, you know, we said, you know, we need to, we need to put this relationship on, a, on a, a better basis so we don't have the kinds of problems we had in the future. And it never, there were some major communication problems. Let's just leave it at that. So we, did, we suggested the idea of developing what's called a memorandum of understanding between the Hopi tribe and the museum. And this MOU outlined how it was we were going to communicate with each other, collaborate with each other. We outlined projects we wanted to work with together. And it basically said, bottom line, we're gonna be friends and we're gonna do stuff. And we're gonna do stuff as mutual, as colleagues and as friends. And uh, so this is the signing of the MOU in March of 2005. There's our board chair at the time, Susie Gerritsen, and Wayne Taylor, the tribal chair. And that's me and uh, Octaviana Salazar, who is um, the head of the Applied Indigenous Studies Program at NAU, Northern Arizona University, who was also a board member at the time. So with that MOU in place, we started working on uh, a variety of different projects. Um, some of which have come to fruition and some of which not, haven't quite yet. But uh, what was important is we established that basis of formal collaboration. One project that we did uh, work on together was the creation of this building. This is uh, the Easton Collection Center and Bill referred to it in his opening remarks. And this is a fairly new building, although it, uh, it's now, what, five, six years now, um, at the museum. And it was a building that was created to store the collections of the museum. And when I came back in 2004, we literally had a file drawer of reports from collections experts that had come to the museum and looked at our collections and how it, they were being managed. And they all essentially said the same thing. Your collections are incredible. Your staff is very dedicated. And your buildings are putting your collections at risk because your buildings are substandard. I mean, we didn't have proper humidity control. We didn't have proper you know, fire suppression. We couldn't control insects. The roof leaked and so forth. So 
we had to build a new, uh, one of the reports said don't try to fix what you have, you'd be throwing bad money after good, start over again. So we said okay. So, um, and we were incredibly fortunate to find some, in, in just the best donors you could ever imagine. Because all they wanted to do is support the project and stay, and, and they said, we don't want to tell you what to do, just make it as good as you can. Now, can you beat that? Uh, so, um, with that, we developed the Easton Collection Center. And there were three major things we had in mind at, that, that um, were important to us as we developed the center. One, we had to have optimal environment for the long-term preservation of our collections. You know, good temperature, good humidity, good materials, you know, all those things that you need to preserve your collections. Two, we wanted a building that was sustainable, a green building, a building that over the life cycle of the building would reduce the cost of, you know, energy and, and be efficient and save the museum money and just be healthy to be in. And the third was because there were so many Native American artifacts in this building, it had to be a building that was culturally appropriate for members of the Native community when they came to the museum. And just to show you what happens when you don't have that, uh, before we built this building, we had a Zuni delegation show up at the museum one day and we were going to go in and look at the Zuni things. And um, as we were about to enter the hallway where the Zuni things were, the question was asked, are there any human remains in there? And I said, uh, well, yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, there are. Well, everybody stopped dead in their tracks and that was the end of the visit. Uh, and so there were situations that were inherently uncomfortable to members of the Native community. Well, these are the kinds of situations we wanted to avoid with this collection center. So we put together a Native American Advisory Committee to work with us on the development of this center. And they came up with a number of key, and it was amazing, it was a, 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 a committee consisting of members of various tribes who who's had collections at the museum or whose cultures were represented at the museum. And um, it was amazing the amount of consensus we got on the key principles. So what were these principles? Oh, well first, we, we had to break ground and we had lots of blessings. Uh, you've seen that picture. Uh, this, this is Vincent Randall from the Yavapai Apache tribe and Robert Baer, also Apache. Uh, this is Wilton Koyahoima from Hopi and he's sprinkling uh, Homa or white cornmeal on the ground as we were breaking ground. Uh, so the building should, first it should face east, should face the rising sun. So it faces east. It should have some circularity of form. Doesn't have to be round, but it shouldn't be square. Shouldn't be a box. So, and it was really fun when we, first built that wall, I remember Mike Cabote, the late Mike Cabote coming by and just stopping in his tracks and looking up at that wall and going, Chaco! <laughs> so, yeah. There's some more views, some of the iconography on the front door. Should be connected with the cycle of the seasons. That objects there's a living aspect to objects and they should feel the change of the seasons. So if you had been in this building just a few days ago on the equinox, the sun comes through this window and hits the very center of this main door that leads into the collections and hits the center of a sun symbol on the upper railing on the second level. And so, you know, that's like, wow, wow, that's really cool. It, and it really works, uh, it does that. So the sun migrates from one corner to another from the winter solstice to the summer solstice and then on the two equinoxes it hits this door. So it's connected to the cycle of the seasons. 
It should have natural light where appropriate. Oh, and this was a huge discussion with the collection staff, uh, as you might imagine, because, you know, no, 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 no natural light, no, no. Well, the, the Native American Advisory Committee felt very strongly about this. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted natural light in this building, so we made some compromises, and we actually set up a situation where um, we have a solar tube coming into where the collections are, and there's a flapper in the tube that opens and closes. So we open, the, the, the solar tube only opens when we need it to or when there's somebody in the room and the rest of the time it, it can remain closed. But there is natural light in there at appropriate times. Uh, use of local materials, this is Kokino sandstone. As they put it, it should feel like it belongs here, okay? a visual connection to the San Francisco peaks, which are sacred to all of the tribes of the area. And the building should be alive. And so, okay, how do we do that? Well, as a matter of fact, we had been talking about the very idea of putting a living roof on the building for some very practical reasons, because we wanted to stabilize temperature and humidity within the building. Well, how do you do that? you do it with a lot of mass. And so we have big thick walls and nothing insulates a roof better than seven inches of topsoil on top of the roof with native grasses and wildflowers blooming all summer long with hummingbirds and butterflies coming in and out. It's just, it's just, and it's just turned out to be really beautiful and very practical. Well, and it's alive. So it's a living building. These are some of the cabinetry inside where we store our collections. And that's a view, we also have, this is a center place where we have directional colors from the different tribes uh, in the middle floor. And some reproductions of petroglyphs along this column here. And then in addition to talking with tribal members about what the building should be like. Then we also then talked about very specific, had a lot of conversations about how certain objects should be cared for and stored. So we got a lot of input on that and uh, tried to accommodate tribal preferences about that. So when we dedicated the building, one of our consultants, uh, and you're gonna hear a little more about this man as we go along, his name is Jim Enote, and he gave the dedicatory speech. And this is, and you can read it, but this is what he said for people hoping or planning for a new vision of what a museum collection center should be and look like. The Easton Center stands out as a threshold and beacon for museum workers throughout the world that the next generations of museums has been entered. The promise that new and better ways of respecting indigenous peoples and their cultures has been redeemed and will continue to improve and knowledge will grow as long as people listen and work together. And the listening and working together is really the key. Uh, and so r right off the bat, the, the native community responded incredibly positively to this building. We haven't had anybody stop at the door and turn around and go the other way. In fact, visitation to the museum by members of the community has increased dramatically as people have come to look at collections and to experience the whole experience of this building. Okay, so Jim Enote, I just uh, wanna say a little bit about him. Jim is a Zuni and he is the director of the Ashwi Awan Museum and Heritage Center in Zuni, New Mexico. That's the museum at Zuni. And Jim called me up not long after I came to m and the second time and introduced himself and we got together and we started having a series of conversations over several years. And I think you could best call these philosophical discussions. And it was about the nature of museums uh, the nature of tribal museums, how tribal people viewed museums, and it's not always positive. I mean, you know, who, 
who, uh, who told us we could go out and collect all this stuff, right? Uh, who told us we could define it in certain ways? Who told us that this was all okay? And um, so, you know, talking about those kinds of issues uh, became very important for us. And we decided what we wanted to do together is build a model relationship between a mainstream museum and a tribal museum. And we were gonna look at all the different ways in which we could do it. And you've seen one of them already, and that is involvement in the development of the collection center. Uh, and Jim was on that advisory committee. So this is the logo of the Ashwi Awan Museum and Heritage Center. And so every year, uh, one of our four festivals is the Zuni Festival of Arts and Culture. And we do this as a partnership arrangement with the museum. They select the speakers, they select the themes, they, they bring their intellectual um, firepower to the event and really define what the event is going to be. And we're the host and we're the sponsor. And you know, we basically say, this is your museum during the course of this event. And um, it's worked out beautifully. The Zuni band and we have you know, the normal things you see at exhibits uh, like these, you know, arts and crafts and ribbons and all that. But we also put a very strong emphasis in all of our festivals on what we call heritage insight programming. And that is communicating about ideas, communicating about worldview, communicating about language, communicating about religion. How do we see things? What is our perspective? And so here's Jim doing a program on Zuni map art. And this was a project that the Ashwiawan Museum undertook to create a series of paintings that they described as maps. They're paintings of different places on the Colorado Plateau that Zuni had been to in their migration in the past. And the way Jim described it is, well, we've, over the last 500 years, we've been remapped. Your maps have lines and grids and, you know, all these formal things. Our maps are different. So let's see, let's see if we get a picture of a, there's one of the maps. That is a map of Ribbon Falls in the Grand Canyon, which is the emergence place of the Zuni onto this world. And so we had 30 of these paintings that were done by Zuni artists mapping the Colorado Plateau from their perspective. And this was an exhibit we developed jointly together and which opened at m and And then we had a catalog, and the formal name of the exhibit was the Zuni World or Ashwiyawan Ulahani. The next project we worked on is um, uh, what we call a collections collaborative project. And this was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And uh, another partner was UCLA. They had some people, some technical people there. And the idea was this, is that a set of museums, including ours, and Denver Museum of Science and Nature, the Denver Art Museum, um, uh, and, um, <laughs> forget, a museum, um, Cambridge University in England. Um, we, all, we all took our collections records with reference to Zuni and downloaded those records into a database at Zuni. And the Zunis took control of the database of their collections, which we gave them. And then they began this project of having elders come in and look at the different collections that we provided digitally to them and commenting on them and describing them and setting up protocols about who in the community could see these records because there were some things that only maybe religious leaders should see. So they set up certain screens and, and a hierarchy of you know, access and beginning, began to populate this database with their own information, deciding what information they wanted to share back with us. So it was a way of basically giving them information about what was in our museums. And Jim is very passionate about this because he had been to a number of museums, 
gone through collections records and found a shockingly high number of collections records just had wrong information. It was just wrong. Or it was just so minimal that it was pr practically useless, like Zuni blanket, you know, that tells you a lot. Um, he loves to tell the story about when they went to Cambridge, there was a, a, a bone, piece of bone that was described as a pendant, and they all, these Zuni guys were there and they were looking at this and they were kind of questioning it, and then one of them picked it up and started, it was a turkey whistle. And so it had been completely misidentified, and they say they just run into this constantly. So what's the problem here? The problem is that there's not enough source community involvement in the description of what's in our collections. So our collections are either inadequately described, or they're incorrectly described, or maybe, you know, both. So this was a project to return data to Zuni so Zunis could see what's out there and record their own information about it. Uh, so here we are, we just finished our meeting on the Collections Collaborative. And this is an example of a piece of the database. And um, you know, they, they are um, typing in information or they're recording information in the Zuni language on the uh, collections. So with this idea of getting better documentation on collections from source communities, um, a very interesting sort of turn of events happened about a year ago. Um, I had been talking for some time with this gentleman, Dr. Uh, Asanori Ito, who is a, a curator at the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka, Japan. And Ito, as we call him, uh, wrote his doctoral dissertation on, guess what? Hopi overlay jewelry. Uh, so he was very interested in that. And so we began c conversations and he was looking through our collections records uh, about the overlay jewelry. And I have to say, when I first looked at these records, I was shocked. And I'll tell you why. Remember, Hopi overlay began at our museum, but there was almost no ethnographic information on that jewelry in the collections database. It might say silver pendant, silver bracelet. It might have had the maker's name, but it might not have. And so this is a huge problem if, with museums like ours. We collect things and then we turn them over to registrars, and I love registrars, don't get me wrong, but they don't have ethnographic training. And so they describe objects from their own perspective. It's silver, it's so many inches wide or centimeters wide, and it's this and that and so forth. But there's almost no cultural context information behind it. So Ito and I started talking about this problem, and we uh, developed what's called an academic agreement between our two institutions with the idea of promoting and pushing the idea of going to source communities and getting better information. Uh, and so uh, this was signed on July 4th, 2014. Uh, this is the director of the museum, Dr. Sudo, and this is Ito, and various and sundry members of our board, Jim Enote again from Zuni, and Lee Kwan Wisioma, head of the Cultural Preservation Office at the Hopi Tribe. So um, our goals are to correct or expand information on the museum collections from the perspective of a source community and to share that information back to the source community and then develop new databases in a common format and then link them internationally so we can talk to each other about our collections. So last, just about a year ago, um, a group of us went to Osaka this is uh, Chip Caldwell from the Denver Museum of Science and Nature and a group of um, Hopi and Zuni individuals. And we went to Japan to talk about how we could further uh, improve and develop documentation of ethnographic collections utilizing source communities. So we had a little symposium. Uh, 
and there I am. I, uh, and we had people from all over Japan and indeed from all over the world at this uh, particular symposium to talk about this problem of ethnographic documentation. And we used some examples from our own history. Uh, you know, here's, here's a couple of Kachina dolls and um, they, they are properly identified but their, their, their names were mistranslated and their names were misspelled in current Hopi orthography. So, uh, and that's a common problem throughout our collection. So getting things right uh, is one of our first uh, priorities. Now here's a, here's a typical catalog record from our collection. This is a Hopi wicker basket. We've got over 200 of these. And we did a search through our collections records and only on four of the records of the 200 did the Hopi name for a Hopi wicker basket pop up. And that, that's, that word is yangyapu. And so, you know, it's just bare information like this. Uh, so, um, you know, and all we have to do, I mean, you know, Hopi's 100 miles away. Is just go and ask people, what, what's going on here? What is this and what does it mean? Um, here's one that's a little bit better has some more information. And actually, believe it or not, I provided that information a long time ago. Um, and, you know, ethnographic, better ethnographic information, but still much more is needed. So uh, what we did in Japan was we just tried out um, how, we, how, what are the protocols? What are the methodologies that we're gonna use to get this type of information? So here's a Hopi and Zuni group looking at the Kachina doll collection at the National Museum. And um, this is a, a gentleman named Ramson Lamatawaima, uh, Hopi. And uh, Ramson and uh, this other gentleman, Gerald of Avendua, um, started just describing and talking in great detail information about the Kachina dolls in this collection in Japan. And, um, we just, we're trying to develop an approach to capturing more information and doing a better job of getting it. Uh, and so this summer, um, a group of uh, Hopi artists came down and worked on our silver collection, the one that I said was poorly documented, and started providing us with better information about the collection. Uh, and so, um, the Zunis, uh, Jim Enote calls this the Amidolani project, or I mean, it's, a hope, it's the Zuni word for rainbow. And, he, and he, again, he's talking about collaboration. And Jim l describes going to many museums, and unnamed, where the attitude is, what do you guys know? You know, what, what uh, you're not scholars, you're not experts, what do you know? And he's saying, we're the people that made this stuff. You know, we want to be on an equal footing. And so that's the movement that we're all pushing here. Um, respecting indigenous knowledge. Some other things I should mention, uh, for the last few years, we've been very actively involved in a process called NAGPRA. You've probably heard of it. It's the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And um, there's a lot of cultural sensitivity around NAGPRA, but I just want to mention that we've been very actively involved in it, and we've been following NAGPRA both to the letter and the spirit of the law, and have repatriated a lot of um, human remains and associated and unassociated funerary objects uh, back primarily to Hopi. Also, uh, in the last several years, we got somewhat involved on a, in a kind of a side way in an issue that has been of great concern to the Hopis, and that involves the sale of friends, as they're called. Uh, we would call them mask in our culture. Um, and um, various efforts have been made to stop this. And uh, we have uh, been involved in terms of do doing some letter writing and some stirring up of things with the French uh, with no luck. 
um, but participating in press conferences to try to call attention to this. And it's a very tricky thing because they do not want to talk about this e explicitly um, because it's a, it's a culturally sensitive issue. So trying to explain to reporters why these sale of these things are a problem when you can't really describe why it's a problem has been a really interesting challenge. We're in the process of developing a new ethnology gallery um, to replace the existing one at the museum. And again, we've um, been convening advisory committees of representatives of the different tribes to ask them to tell us their stories. This is your voice. This is your opportunity to share your values and the things you think that are important to share with the outside world. We're not writing the exhibit we've actually turned the process of exhibit writings to members of different tribal communities. And it, it's, it's, that's in process right now, and it's really interesting. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, uh, but what's coming out is what tribal people are telling us is, yeah, we want to talk about our architecture. Yeah, we want to talk about our subsistence. Yeah, we want to talk about our social organization. But what we really want to talk about are our values, the things that are really important to us and the things that um, have held us together in the past and have been important for, for making us who we are. These are the things we really want to share. And those are the things that often don't get shared enough in museum exhibits. So these are coming out in our conversations. Here's a recent consultation we had with members of the Havasupai tribe. And um, they actually selected what they want to see on display representing Havasupai. They did it. Um, and then we said prayers over it. And um, this is just last, day before yesterday. Um, we are planning as part of our ex exhibit expansion a, a new gallery on Kachinas, uh, Kachina sculptures and Kachina dolls. And we got a major collection donated to us. And so again, we had a group of elders in to look at the collection and to tell us what could be displayed and what couldn't and, um, and get their take on everything. And I think if you just, so here's, here we're looking at a specific sculpture and look at the intent look on the, everybody's face. They were just absolutely fascinated with this collection and the discussions were incredible. Um, and so we just feel like all of this participation, all of this communication is enriching us and um, making us a better museum. Uh, in fact, this last May, uh, m and was awarded the National Medal of Museum Service for its, um, engage for its community engagement. And we were very proud and I got to go to the White House with my friend Janita Benali who represented the community she was a representative of the community and she's a native person. And Michelle Obama gave us this award. And then last Wednesday, um, I, was, I was summoned to a meeting of the Hopi Tribal Council and told to appear at 10.30 in the morning. No explanation. I was so nervous. <laughs> I thought I was going to get ripped. And instead, I, I, got a, I got a pipe and, and a certificate of appreciation and saying, hey, thanks for working with us. Thanks for being our friend. Uh, and that was very, very rewarding. So, one more. So I think the take-home principles are these, that we who are in museums that work with native communities have, there's really been a shift, and we're not alone in this. Other museums are doing the same thing. Um, but I like to think we're a leader. Um, consultation, inclusion, collaboration, um, honoring Native perspectives and giving them a voice and being partners. Those are our bedrock principles with working with Native communities. And uh, I think I'll stop there, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes. When you have you had situations where you've had serious disagreements within communities, and if so, how do you navigate that landscape? 
we actually, I know this is gonna be hard to believe, but we actually have not encountered that yet. Um, and um, I suspect that we may, as we get along, as we get further along in the development of our ethnology exhibit, um, we might run into that. Um, I, I don't know that I have a formula for dealing with that other than just continue dialogue and, and discuss and let's just see where we end up. You know, I, I don't know if that's a very good answer, but that's the best I can do right now. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I don't, I, the only pictographs I had were petroglyphs and they, and they were, they were reproductions of petroglyphs from up in Utah and they were very old ones because we didn't want to get into tribal specific petroglyphs on the collection center, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Well, first of all, we do have lots of room for growth. We've got a lot of space. Um, and we, we, when we designed the building, we designed a footprint for an addition in the future. And we actually put lentils into the wall. So when we do that expansion, we can just punch right through the wall and keep going. But we expect this facility to work for us for quite a while longer. Now, here's the thing. You say, well, didn't you plan for the growth? Yes, we did, except when people saw this new building, they said, oh, I want my collection there. So, you know, it's just been growing. So, yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, as uh, <coughs> the different tribes are starting to talk more and more, want to share their values. Yes. Um, do you see a lot of common values between the different tribes, or do you see a, a lot of different values? There's a lot of commonality. The things that come out, you know, respect, cooperation, reciprocity, humility, those are the main ones. You know, you just hear this over and over and over again. And, it's, it's, and they all have their own words for them, and so we want to bring the, their own language into this. So our new exhibit will be expressed with tribal voices, as we're going to try to bring their own languages into it with translation so you can, people can hear the languages and hear the differences in the language families and the languages um, and get a feeling for what's, who these people are and what's really important to them. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. I'll be around. <laughs> <laughs>